Welcome, Nancy. Thank you so much for agreeing to speak with me today. And I have a few questions to ask you about your life as an activist. We'll start with what in your youth led you to become an activist? Yeah, well, now it's how do we define youth? Because <laughs> now that I'm in my 70s, youth is a long time ago. But I grew up in a very homogenous suburban community outside of Albany, New York. I had very little exposure to political ideas. I had a yearning within for something that I could now label as social justice as a child. I think many children do actually have a sense of morality, fairness, what's right and wrong. But I didn't actually get exposed to activism until my 20s when I moved next door to the great historian Howard Zinn. Howard Zinn, if folks don't know, and he's one of the Americans who tell the truth, was a very well-known radical historian who wrote many, many books, gave many, many talks, and inspired millions of people all over the world with ideas from very progressive leftist politics. And he was my next door neighbor for four and a half, five years. And then we became fast friends for the rest of his life, 30 more years. During that time, I was soaking up new information in my 20s, just, you know, plus it was the 60s and there was an awful lot happening in, in the world around me. But here I am living next door to probably the best known um, radical voice in the country. And it turned out he had a great sense of humor and a wonderful personality. He loved hanging out on the front steps and talking politics. So he gave me tons of books to read and, and I would think and ask questions and we'd talk politics for years. So he was really a mentor. And it was then that I truly absorbed deep within myself the, uh, the concepts of social justice, economic justice, and what it means to, to take action to make the world better. And Howard was a person who believed that people can change the world. He was the most optimistic person I've ever known in my life. And he really, truly was uh, completely committed to believing in people and the power of people to, to make change for the better. It's hard to see right now in our country because we see anything but that. But that is a, a point of view that he influenced me greatly with and became part of me and the, the activist I've been ever since my, my mid-20s. He would say to me, I don't know anything about early childhood education. He was very self-effacing that way. He never claimed he knew anything he didn't know, but he knew a lot. So no, we would have good dialogues and I'd be able to contribute things to him Though he was a college professor and so was I, we had similar beliefs as educators. We're not top-down kinds of educators. We listened to students. We invited them to have input around curriculum and what it was they wanted to know. I would say those were ideas we shared. But he, how he was um, a grandfather, he was wonderful with his grandkids who were over often. Uh, he had an intuitively wonderful way with children. What continues to motivate you and guide you and give you courage? One of the things I think about this idea of activism is, is how we define it. Because you could define activism very narrowly. And I think I have an extremely broad definition of activism. So yes, of course, it's important to go out in the streets when there is a Black Lives Matter movement march and to go out and participate with other people because organizing and being in a community of other activists is hugely inspiring and necessary for bringing about large scale change because we've seen through history that people's movements have affected history. We see that again and again and I'm sure people listening um, are learning about that or do know about that. There are other ways to be an activist because if you are really an activist, it becomes part of your blood and your way of being in the world. If you carry that with you in your heart and your mind, you actually, we see all kinds of places to be an activist in small ways every day, no matter where we are. And one of the things Howie said was small acts by millions of people can change the world. And there are many small acts we can all take. I think all of us, no matter where we are, and what we're doing can see places where we can be an activist and contribute to social justice in our everyday lives. And that that's one of the challenges to try to do, to not do something huge and momentous and grand, but to see that wherever we are in our own lives, there are steps 
we can take. There are things we can do, how we treat people, how we talk to them, how we acknowledge their presence respectfully or not, how we question things. We don't accept the status quo that we're handed, but we question. In my case, as an educator, for example, I see a report from the DOE, the Department of Education Civil Rights Office, that says somehow 8,000 children, preschoolers, were suspended from public preschool the previous year. And the majority of them were low-income boys of color. And I'm immediately, wait a minute, what? that's in the report. We have to find out why that's there. We have to explore that. We have to look at the conditions that are creating that, raise our voices to see that that's a social justice issue. So there are many opportunities in my field of education to be an activist in the way that I'm saying. I was one of the founders of the Peaceable Schools program at Lesley University. In that program, we taught teachers how to um, teach nonviolence, conflict resolution, and mediation in schools. Uh, It was a wonderful effort. It went on for a number of years. It's gone now as so many of those kinds of things are. In that program, for example, I'm saying I went to New York City where we had one of our programs and watched this mediation program. So there was a little girl there. Her name was Denisha. She was in the fourth grade and she was mediating a dispute of kids who were in kindergarten. And she just did it with such skill and just amazing skill. And I said to her, Denisha, you really know how to be a mediator after the whole thing was over. And she said, oh, yes, I even mediate all the conflicts we have at home with my brothers and sisters. And I said, oh, you do? How old are they? And she goes, oh, they're in their 20s. But that's an example of what I'm, it's one example of what I'm talking about, which is being an activist in your everyday life, like that little Denisha was right in her family or in her school. And those opportunities are there for all of us, sometimes to find and sometimes to create. This is a society begging for people to be active, proactive around issues of social justice. The activist voice in education today is desperately needed. For the last 20 years, we've taken a horrible turn in education where there's been much more privatizing of public schools, much more testing, a much more restrained environment where there's less play for kids and less arts and music and this, you know, narrow definition of what does it mean to know anything, which is just literacy and math. And it's become very top down and data driven education without any heart and without any input from the students. It's a, it's a, this is a bad period in education. Many of us who I would consider education activists have been working now for quite a few years to try to push against that turn of things. And of course, it's taken the biggest toll on young children because young kids really need a lot of play, a lot of social interaction, a vibrant physically active environment. That's why that Department of Education report came out. They're suspending kids because they're being inappropriately taught and they're told to sit still when they're four when they can't. I started with other colleagues, a nonprofit called Defending the Early Years. We have a website too, dey.org, where you can see the many, many projects we're always doing that advocate for young children who cannot advocate for themselves. That's a big difference. I mean, you and I can speak up for ourselves. We may not, but we can. But little kids really need adults to advocate for them and to see where injustice is occurring. And it's occurring in you know many, many places where young kids' lives are, starting with the fact that they come to the world without a fair start. Some kids born into poverty, some into enormous privilege, kids going to really inferior schools versus when you think about preschools, families that have income send their kids to really nice Reggio Emilia and Montessori programs and all these private schools that families can pay for. But if families don't have money, then kids go to public preschools and they're they're truly inferior to the other schools. There are so many places these days for education activists to take stands that it's it's a big plateful. It's really wrong that the education system has become driven by standardized testing because you can just simply look at a zip code 
and see the relationship between where kids live and what those test scores are. It's all about advantages and disadvantages. It's, there's nothing wrong with the kids who are scoring low. They don't have the opportunities. What advice do you have for youth activists? Giving advice isn't something I'm used to doing, <laughs> I'm going to try. When I think about this, I think one of the things is when we are activists and we're committed to goals like social justice, racial justice, economic justice, we can easily fall into a trap where we objectify the other who doesn't agree with us. We can start to label or, or characterize or reduce the other person to something other than a full human being. One of the things I think very important for actually success of social justice movements over time is that we develop within ourselves the capability to recognize all people we deal with whatever their views, as full human beings, and attempt to see the commonalities we have with them, because there are many. If we can have an attitude like that, uh, really compassion for them, understanding for their, our differences, it helps to lead us in a more nonviolent direction. Because I think when we get into that us versus them kind of mentality, it's easy to take further step. I mean, we're seeing incredibly dramatically now in American society of just, you know, people further and further and further from each other in terms of understanding any common shared values or goals. And it leads to violence, which is what we just saw in Washington last week with the insurrection. That kind of thinking leads to violence and doesn't help us, I think, in the long run to build a society that's based on equality and uh, racial justice and social justice. If we keep fighting, hurting each other, tearing each other down, then our attention goes there and doesn't progress towards a better world for all people, which we want to move towards as a unit. We want all of us to move in that direction. One of the things that keeps me going, I think, is that my professional work has been with young children because they are so receptive and so open to kindness, humanitarian values. They love learning skills, especially social skills. So a lot of my work was working with teachers to find ways to help kids develop social skills when they were four, five, six, seven, and eight. There are many, many creative ways to do it. I've become convinced ever since I started doing the nonviolence conflict resolution work in with young kids that if we could work with young people from an early age, building these kinds of awareness and skills, we'd have a really different society. That's great advice. So thank you so much, Nancy, for taking a little bit of time here and good luck with your new endeavor. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much.